Hi, everyone. Hello. Nice to see you. Nice to see you here from the keynote just ended. Very impressed at your speed. Um, so welcome to the Xeno Linguistics panel 2949. Uh, we're going to get into the meat of what we've been doing for the past year. But first, we have a couple of updates. And even before that, we'd like to introduce ourselves. So I'm Sherry Heiberg. I'm the archivist at CIG. Uh, I work on planet stuff. I work with Britain on alien languages, and I organize Confluence. Got all kinds of projects in Britain. And also. I'm the Briton. I'm yeah. the Xeno linguist mm -hmm. here at Star Citizen, and uh, have been involved for actually several years now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in working uh, somewhat in the background on on all the alien languages. So let's meet Chris. Chris has been working more recently on some exciting stuff, and yeah. he will introduce himself. Okay. I'm Chris Harrow. I'm a, a font designer. I, I started um, learning Xi'an uh, two years ago at the uh, CitizenCon in Frankfurt. And um, I think right after it, I, I started um, cr uh, creating a font that can be used easily or more easily or more natively. So um, <laughs> I was working like six months on, on, the, on the font and um, then I am I'm already uh, also a Xi'an uh, expert at the uh, UAE Xeno Linguistic Institute. It's a Discord server <laughs> where we provide um, learning materials for, for interested people and everything you need for, for Xi'an and in languages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're all, we've all been very impressed with uh, Chris's hard work. Very happy to have him on as a font contractor without his work. Uh, we would not have the languages that we have. We uh, depended on him very much to get the fonts ready for all the documents that we've put out. We very much appreciate him. Um, and he has a couple of updates he'd like to tell you about. Okay. Um, I think the, the last year, more on and off, I was working on, working on the Xi'an language document. And um, I've uh, completely worked through the document and found every Xi'an word that was not in the dictionary. And every word. Yeah. So many every words. Word. I added <laughs> more than 500 words to the dictionary. So currently, I think we are at, we are at uh, 1944 words in the dictionary. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I've completely um, reworked the document to, to include the new font and the native writing. So it's more. Uh, and I found. Um, I uh, completely uh, reformatted the, the letter of uh, Master Professor Tai, so everything is shiny and new. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, Britain also put out, what can you tell them what you put out with the international pronunciation? Yeah, so um, on the screen up here, mm -hmm. we had uh, almost from the very beginning out the gate, people wanting to know precisely what uh, the sounds of Xi'an were in IPA, in the International Phonetic Alphabet. So it helps for the people who are super picky about the way things are going to sound. Mm -hmm. So we've added a few uh, new sections to the document with Chris's help. Uh, I hope that everybody will uh, find that information useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it should be published right about now. So <laughs> if you go to the dictionary, uh, the Robert Space Industries website, you should uh, see a new update from the overview of the Xi'an language for diplomats. Um, oh, Chris, you should tell them about how the Xi'an font that you made works. Yeah, um, the font is an open type font, and it, it uses a contextual substitution. So basically, it's, it's a rule set. Um, when you just type, in this example, Shay Sulan, you just type X, E, the second E for the long E. Then you type, um, I've added uh, numbers that are adjacent to um, letters, they are, will be converted into the pitch marks. For example, this the falling pitch in this example is a, a 2. Then a, you, you type S-U-E for sue. And um, then you have to type a, a, a 0 as a divider, because the rule set allows, for example, the L of len to, to fit into, into the, the second syllable, like swell. But I want, just want to type, uh, type sue. So you have to add the uh, divider after sue, and then type len. And this, this is it, basi basically. You nothing, not, no special characters, no code tables or anything. It's very easy to type. And yeah. I, I want to comment on this because as the primary user of Chris's font, it changed everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, it makes dealing with Xi'an and typing in Xi'an um, 
thousands of times easier than it was two oh, years yes. ago. So uh, Sherry's also a primary Yes, user. I use it all the time for various things that we haven't published yet. But <laughs> trust me when I say it's been an extremely useful tool for people, not only in marketing, but in design. And the best part is um, the font will be available in the fan kit soon mm -hmm. for all of you to, to use. and. Yeah. Have your own Xi'an tech. <laughs> yeah. So enjoy. You enjoy. will enjoy it. Believe yeah. me, you will enjoy it. Additionally, let's get into the meat of the presentation. Uh, for the past year, we have been working on the Banu language. The Banu language is ready. Um, it should be published on the site also right about now. Um, it is a 200-page document uh, in the voice of people who are working for the Rust Society. Um, here's what it looks like. And let me, let me tell you about this. <laughs> yeah. So this, in a very snarky kind of way, says, uh, you can't read this yet. <laughs> but you will be able to after yeah. today if you study really hard. Exactly. So we're going to tell you all about this, this new language and how it works. Mm -hmm. uh, so a little bit about the Rust Society before we get into the Banyu language. If you're not familiar with them, they're kind of a blue collar guild slash union of haulers and scrappers uh, came together a few hundred years ago during one of the Teveran Wars. They um, do a lot of trading a lot of war, uh, all across the verse from the Xi'an Empire to the Banu Protectorate to, of course, the UEE. And they put this guide out for their members to help them out in any potential dealings they might have in the Protectorate. Um, and we wrote it in the voice of characters, the voice of people who live in the universe. Um, tell us about your character, Britton. My character, my character's name is uh, Albion Lacroix, and uh, he's a linguist at Song University on Terra, and uh, he grew up in a family that were of diplomats that interacted primarily with Banu, so mm -hmm. he speaks Banu pretty well, Al. He's pretty good at Banu. <laughs> and uh, my character, Reggie, she used to be a hauler, now she is a teacher of Banu culture. She indentured herself for a little, for a little bit of time when she was, uh, you know, just, just after getting her equivalency. She just wanted to travel around for a while in between hauling jobs, and she got pretty familiar with Banu culture, um, and consequently that helped her score a teaching job at Song University on Terra. A little bit safer than hauling. <laughs> yes, safer than hauling and definitely safer than indenture. <laughs> And, uh, ooh, Sunda. Sunda is the Banu mentor for Reggie, who um, taught her all about Banu culture. And, yeah, Sunda is about right here, because... <laughs> yeah, it's the mysterious presence that <laughs> yeah, is not here yet Mysterious, <laughs> mysterious we can't meet, yeah. meet them yet. Mm -hmm. So, you can't have language without culture, right? Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's where I think you, you start. Mm -hmm. It's where I always start, anyway. Yeah. So the same with Xi'an, before we started work on the Banu language, uh, Will and Dave and Adam, the narrative team, and Britt and I, we all got together and we talked. We had a bunch of meetings about ways to flesh out the Banu culture that we hadn't yet fleshed out. One of the wonderful things about working with Britton is that when it's time to get the language together, he pushes us to expand the culture even further than we've already um, expanded it. So w during the creation of this language, we learned even more about the Banu that we hadn't already hadn't already known yet. Yeah, she's used to my emails that say, "What about this? What about this? And but like, what oh, about we that? Thought about that? But what about this?" <laughs> <laughs> so, mm -hmm. if there's no answer when I write, then it has to be figured out. Exactly. So, exactly. Welcome, welcome to world building. Yeah. <laughs> so, some of the Banu keywords that we came up with when trying to decide how the language would be um, colorful, colorful because Banu love. Flamboyance, they love shiny things. They love things that are gaudily de decorated. But they also have to be useful, which is why we have functional as one of the keywords. Um, any Banu object that is pretty, you can be sh absolutely sure that it has a function. Because if it doesn't have a function, even if it's pretty, Banu think it's useless. There's no reason to have it. Uh, they're very savvy. They're very smart. Uh, they're always looking out for themselves. They always want to be sure that they're going to get the best deal in whatever dealings they might be having. But they're also very polite, because one of the key things in getting a good business deal is to be as polite as possible and to be very good at manipulating language in your favor. 
<laughs> yes. Yeah. At the same time, they're also very easygoing when they're not on the clock, per se. They play very hard. They love um, Sada Ball, for example, one of the fun things that they've adapted from, hu adapted from human culture. They love going out drinking. They love partying. So if you run into a Banu out in Banu world and they're not on the clock and you want to party like you've never partied before, <laughs> just go hang out with them. You'll find something. Yeah, if you need to leave Bar Citizen early, don't hang out with the bun. No, <laughs> you will not leave early. <laughs> so, um, culture-specific words and phrases. It, that's pretty much everything we came up with, yeah? Like, almost everything that is in the language is very tied in with the culture. Yeah, it's a, mm -hmm. I mean, they're, you know, they're everyday words for door. And yeah, whatnot. everyday words for I door. I hope there's a word for door. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, we, it's nice to have a guideline because it, it helps you mm -hmm. think about how the pieces and parts might fit together mm -hmm. and what some of the things that might be emphasized over other things. And I'll talk about that in a little bit coming up. Definitely. Uh, so, quick overview of the Banu for do those who don't know what a Suli is, because I talk about Sulis quite often. Uh, in the future of this presentation. <laughs> a Suli is more or less a combination guild and family that Banu are raised in. Uh, it's not, they're not blood related. Uh, they all gather together around a specific skill set. So like if you're in a Suli, say for linguists, or say if Britain was a Banu, Britain would have been purchased on the market for uh, skilled children who are, show promising skills in, linguist, in uh, linguistics. Britain would have been raised by the Bennu who bought him. They would not be his parents, though. They would be kind of like combination teachers and bosses. So they would be extracting labor out of him, but also teaching him the trade. And when Britain finally pays off the debt that he accrued during his purchase, like what happens is when you get uh, indentured, when you are an apprentice who is bought, this debt is on you, and you have to pay it off through your labor to the Suli that purchased you. So once uh, linguist Banu Britain comes of age and pays off his debt, Britain can either choose to stay with the Suli that raised him, um, Britain can leave if they didn't treat him well, or Britain might have to leave because the Esso Suli, who is the leader of the Suli, may have divested at that point. And we'll get into divestment later. So that's a quick thing. That This is this something that comes up over and over again in Banu culture is the idea of Sulis and the idea of debt. And, and the cool thing about, um, about the guide that you're going to get today is that it talks in a great deal uh, of, mm -hmm. of detail and gives examples of how these ideas and concepts play out in their life cycle and, mm -hmm. and other things. There's a lot of detail. Yeah, and you see from these words that we have on screen about the idea of debt or the idea of politeness as well. Like um, the words for correct and incorrect are not directly correct and incorrect because both of those, like saying someone was perfectly correct, would, would might, might imply that they did so well that you now owe them. And if you say that they're directly incorrect, that's sort of rude <laughs> to a Banu. Yeah. So, so it, yeah. Yeah. So you, you, you might say something like, um, like if, some, if something correct, you would just say inomani, which means, oh, you understand. You got that. You got that right. Mm -hmm. And um, if, if they don't, then if, if somebody doesn't understand, you don't want to say, oh, you're wrong. Oh, that's so, so you, rude. You might just say, <laughs> you know, eto jarez o miyama, or I'll repeat that. Or, mm -hmm. you know, I, it, the person who has detected that you are wrong is going to kind of take some of the responsibility for not, for your not understanding, even if it's really not their fault at all. Yeah. So that's, that's, those play out with... Mm -hmm the kind of normal conversational bridge phrases that yeah. you have in the language too. Yeah, and similarly, I, a direct I'm sorry doesn't exist. So if a Banu apologizes to you, they will probably say something like, I'm sorry you're offended, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or like, I'm sorry you're upset. Yeah, yeah, you know, that, or something <laughs> like that. Uh, it, I, I, I acknowledge that you, yeah. you are unhappy about something. Yeah, so you. they're saying, you're unhappy. I didn't do anything wrong, but you're unhappy, and let's just get that out there. Yeah. <laughs> And they have no idea of pure art. I get more into this later, like I said earlier, but that object on the screen is, it looks very pretty. It looks like something you might see on a shelf, but it's a tool that Banu used to help them make decisions. Yeah. Yeah. Or attract attention. Yeah. The word, any kind of, the word for like beautiful or pretty just means it's eye catching. It gets your eye. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's some well-defined mm -hmm. version of what beautiful is. It just means people pay attention to it. They, 
Lamba. They look at it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so scavenging and adapting are some other key cultural things that Banu do. They uh, are known for finding any good tech that they like or any good ideas that they like and just uh, like pulling it whole cloth into Banu culture. It's like they find, they find a good working engine, for example. It's not even just like cultural things. It's like, oh, this engine is great. Let's just repair it forever until we maybe find something new. Like they won't buy something or they won't use something just because it's new. They will use something new if it's better, but otherwise they're just gonna keep fixing the same thing as long as they possibly can. Um, and this symbol up here, real quick, is you might have seen it in, on the website in the, in the ship pages maybe. It is a stamp, it means made by Banu. It doesn't stand for any corporation because like I said earlier, they don't have corporations, they don't have inheritance, they don't have any like big business or anything. They have a bunch of small guilds but they all agree that they are Banu, and Banu made this. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's Embe Banu, it just means the, mm. the manufacturing of this thing was by Banu. Yeah, and they want you to think that because it was by Banu, it's way better than anything else. <laughs> they also have a different time scale. That played pretty hard into the creation of the language. Um, there's no central clock, because they're not really a very, uh, they're not a centrally organized socio-political system. So they all have personal clocks that count down to their divestment. Uh, their divestment is kind of a combination blowout, retirement, party, and living wake. Once they get old enough, they will give away the wealth that they accrued during their lifetime to the members of their suli, and then they'll take a share for themselves and kind of go away and leave their suli behind. And this is another, this is another way for Banu to avoid debt, because as a Banu gets older, they might start slowing down, they might start bringing the, um, the productivity of the, the Suli down. So they get rid of stuff that they can get rid of, they take their stuff and they leave, and no one owes each other anything, and no one is beholden to anyone, and the Banu that divested can go spend the rest of their days betting on races if they so choose, or whatever. Whatever they want to do. Yeah. Um, so some Banu will set contracts by their divestment clock, so you need to be aware if you're entering into a really long-term contract with a Banu, when's your divestment clock running out? Because Maybe they might not tell you, you know, just depending on what's beneficial to them at the time. Hey, they're calculating. They're calculating, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so this will be something that you run into, and it can be a little bit confusing for humans, but again, because they're Banu, they're happy to help you out if you ask them questions. But you do have to remember to ask them questions. So Banu physiology also played a big role in the creation of the language because they don't have any gender. Uh, there's no, they don't know he or she. They will happily adopt words if you want to be called he or she. They don't really, they don't really care. It's no, no big deal to them. But in, their, uh, in the core of the language, they use a singular they to refer to one another. Uh, they have very short sleep cycles. So they, uh, they see that humans sleep for around eight hours at a time. They think that's a little weird. <laughs> they, think that's, they think that's ganga, excessive. <laughs> excessive. <laughs> like Drambas of ganga. Yeah. It's too sleeping for too long. <laughs> exactly. They can sleep. They can sleep sitting up, they can sleep lying down. They usually catnap for about eight minutes at the time throughout the day. Um, if they sleep for a long time, they might sleep, might sleep for, up, for an, up to an hour. It's a really long time. And if a bunch of them are tired at once, they'll just kind of cuddle on this big sleeping platform in a big Banu pile. But um, not, it's not necessarily gonna be horizontal. Maybe they'll lean against a wall. Maybe they'll just sit in a chair. It just depends on how they're feeling at the time and what the suli is like. They can also eat or drink almost anything, and this is very important for humans to know because their idea of what's poisonous and breathable is very different from ours. <laughs> so if you go into a Banu-only area or a Banu-majority area, you need to be sure what the atmosphere is made of, and you need to be sure that you can eat the food because they can eat or drink almost anything. Xi'an food, no problem. But they like catering to humans. So mm -hmm. in, in any kind of environment that the, the Banu would, would be welcoming of humans. They, they understand that, oh, you need the human toilet and you need beds that are flat that people can lie on and you need food that humans can eat. So mm -hmm. um, they, they are rather aware of the fact that their needs are quite different than human needs. So Absolutely. that plays out in a lot of the example sentences too that we have in the document. Mm -hmm. Haggling is embedded into the culture. We have a big haggling section in the document to teach you how to haggle with a Banu in the language that they prefer. Uh, they're always done to negotiate with a smile. They love smiling. 
They um, won't generally haggle in human majority areas because they've found, based on the rules of the marketplace, that most humans aren't going to be aren't going to know to haggle or will have trouble haggling. So if you in area 18, for example, you're probably not going to find a Banu who's going to haggle with you. But if you're in the protectorate or on one of the flotillas, they're all going to want to haggle, and they will rip you off if you don't. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's to them. It's not ripping you off. <laughs> no, no, to them, it's just like getting what they they wanted. It's like you were an idiot for not asking, so I guess you deserve this. <laughs> yeah, you didn't. You didn't take the time to negotiate. Mm -hmm. you, you weren't willing to wail, so yeah. you didn't. You, you don't deserve a different price yeah. because you didn't put in the effort. Exactly. Uh, I've touched on debt and indenture as a big central concept in Banu culture. Um, I think I covered most of what indenture is in the first slide with the apprenticeship, but you can also indenture yourself as an adult. So if, say, you take on a huge amount of debt to a Banu or in the Banu protectorate, or even in human or Xi'an space, if you're desperate enough, you can sell yourself to a Banu Suli or to an Esso Suli, or you can go directly to an uh, indenture Suli who will place you into you know, something that suits your skills. Yeah, it's like an yeah. a, a indenture agency. Yeah, an indenture agency, yeah. more or less. This to the Banu is a, the most humane way, humane way to pay off debt, because to them, chaining someone to a debt that they can't pay for the rest of their life and having to live like, oh, if only I could pay off this debt, that to them, that's, that's monstrous. <laughs> but to us, the idea of indenture is monstrous because we're different. No, it's, uh, there's an example sentence in the document about indenture being a pathway to mm -hmm. financial freedom, yeah. famie, to be free of debt. Yeah, and to a, to a Banu, this is just like going through apprenticeship, so they really don't see the big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and now that we've covered a bunch of bits of Banu culture, there's a lot more in the Rust Society document, so do read it as soon as you can. Let's um, pass the clicker over to Britain, and we okay. will talk about... The we'll, language. we'll talk about the language. Yeah. And I okay. That's where we are. Okay. Let's keep going. Um, in figuring out what what uh, uh, created language should be in, in the function of world building, uh, it's important, of course, to know what the language is going to sound like. Mm. So out out the gate with this document, we're talking in IPA about how everything sounds. It's also important for for immersive experience to have fun writing to deal with, right? right. <laughs> so we have a new writing system that, again, until today, nobody's seen before, except Chris. Except he's seen <laughs> He's seen more of it than anybody yeah. probably ever wants to. What was it like seeing the language for the first time? Yes, it's, it's, very, it's very organic and very, very, very different than, than our normal human writing. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's an interesting system. Yeah. Yeah, it's a new it's a new system. It's kind of similar to some things um, in human writing, and I'll talk about that a little bit coming up. But it's also different. Yes. Um, so the other thing is grammar, right? So there there's some things in grammar that are related to to culture directly sometimes, um, and we'll touch on some of those things too. But the there is a lot of grammar in the document coming. Maybe a little bit less grammar than in the Xi'an document because there's a lot more context about indenture and aging and mm -hmm. you know, other things that are very different about the Banu. Um, but there is a grammar section in there as well. But let's start by talking about the sounds. So Banu is, uh, is a relatively easy, I think very easy, actually, language to pronounce. There are no tones oh, yeah. or pitches or anything that's complicated like in Xi'an. Yeah. Um, there are six vowels, but let's start with a few um, of the main ones first. So ah, ooh, e, these are very predictable kinds of sounds that occur in human languages. Uh, most syllables are uh, consonant vowel. So da, du, di, it's very, the, the SRB, the standard Romanized mm -hmm. Banu, is, is quite easy to read, I think. Oh, absolutely. But what's a little bit different about it, and certainly very different from Xi'an, is that there are lots of consonant clusters, double, double consonant, and then a vowel sound. So, we get nda, nda is, a, is a normal to them, just like a regular consonant. Nda is not, not any different than ka or pa or ta to them. It's, it's just nda. It's, a, it's one, they think of it as one sound. So we get nda. And if we add uh, ndu and ndi, then it's just all nda, ndu, ndi. 
But if this were run together as one word, if there were a word, andandundi, then it would be stressed on the first syllable. Mm -hmm. And I know that because the language has what is referred to as a vowel sonority hierarchy. This means that in context, some vowels are always treated as stronger and more important than the other ones. And the, the, the vowels go in order. I, uh, that's technically a diphthong if you know about language, but I, a, u, e, e, o. And an I is always gonna be the strongest sound in a word. If a word has a I sound in it, that's gonna be the strongest, whether it comes at the beginning or the end or in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, if it has an A, then A is gonna be stressed less than I would be. And way down at the other end is O, and O is the weakest sound in the Banu language. So uh, certain languages tend to have weak sounds. Um, so for example, an O sound in French, or just an E, what we'd normally see is E like in the word je for, I, for me. That, drops out a lot. So in Banu, the O drops out a lot, like mm -hmm. all the time. And let me show you an example of that. Again, it's way down at the, the end of the hierarchy, so it's always going to be weak. So who's seen this word spell before? Suli. Yeah, Sulis. Okay. So the way Sherry just pronounced this is very close to the way the, the Banu pronounce it. And if we think about the hierarchy, then we know that O is going to be very, very weak. So to the Banu, this is three syllables, so, u, and li. But o is super weak. It's the weakest it could possibly be. So when they pronounce it in everyday speech, it just comes out as suli. So the o is so quiet that you basically don't hear it. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds kind of like just suli. But it's technically three syllables in the Banu language. So just one quiet syllable. Yes, one of them's just really quiet. So let's do a test here. So based on the sonority hierarchy of the vowels, who has a guess how you would pronounce this word? Okay, here in the front. Kida, Kida exactly. Perfect. And that's because an A is always going to be stronger than an I, unless they've marked it with like the equivalent of an accent mark or something like that. And that happens when they borrow foreign words, hu human words or Xi'an words. Sometimes they, they put irregular stress, but that's because they don't see it as a native Banu word yet. Eventually, everything turns into <coughs> a native Banu oh, word. Oh, everything is Banu eventually. Yeah. But um, <laughs> the writing can be quite exotic. Um, you might see these and think, oh, that's six different languages, but it's not. <laughs> it's just different fonts. So in the same way that we write things in different typefaces for various reasons, uh, they do too, normally to get attention for better oh, yeah. marketing, to make more money. So they care about it for kind of maybe different reasons than mm -hmm. we do. Um, but everything is still a standard syllable, no matter how exotic it looks. And I'm going to step you through pretty quickly how, how the basics of the system work. So here we have all the syllables using B as a consonant, as an example. So we get bai, ba, bu, bi, be, bo. And, um, I don't mean to say in the pronunciation rules that, um, that an, an E sound is never strong. If you had a word, there isn't one that I know of, but if you had a word, bebo, it would be pronounced bebo because be is stronger than O. It doesn't mean that you're going to say be. You know, you, you, you pronounce both of them. You just have to give the stress where the stress is due, and that's on the stronger syllable. But in the writing, everything is based on a capsule. So a capsule can be any kind of shape. It can be a perfect circle or oval or square, but it's going to come in these variations closed, open on the top, open on the bottom, and open on the top and the bottom. And then they stick something in the middle to make the sound. So an S is closed on the top and bottom, a K is open on the top, a J is closed on the bottom, excuse me, open on the bottom and closed on the top, an F is open on the top and the bottom. So once you, once you get used to the basic forms of the consonants, we then add vowel diacritics mm. to the top and bottom, or top or bottom, to get the sounds fi, fa, fi, fu, bi, be, fo. Mm -hmm. I sound like Jolly Green Giant or yeah. something, but... Um, <laughs> you gonna go after my blood? 
the <laughs> <laughs> but these are these are the way that you do vowels on on almost every syllable in terms of the numbers of them. And Chris has <laughs> struggled with this for a long time, <laughs> yes. and he's going to tell you how easy it's going to be for all of you because of how hard it was for him. Um, they're also standalone, independent vowels. So I, uh, u, e, e, o. And if you ever see a big block of Banu text, it's going to be centered and you know vertically. Mm -hmm. It's always going to be centered, though. They they write everything that way. Um, the other thing is that the, there's n almost no inflection in the language. So here we have the meaning for one wing or five wings. In English, we would have to have an S on wings because it's plural. Mm -hmm. But the Banu simply go for dasi uh, go ipuma or futu go ipuma. And they don't, that word go in there is something we'll explain later, but there's no change. The words just stay the same, basically. Mm -hmm. Word order is important, like it is in many human languages. So unjo bubu osara is unjo messed up the food. Mm -hmm. Maybe they didn't do a great job of cooking it. Um, but they do have stomachs of iron. Oh, yeah. So with osara ye bubu unjo, the food did not mess up Unjo. That's very unlikely to happen. Yeah, I mean, it, the food won't mess up Unjo. He's, he's fine. Yes. He's probably fine. Joe's a human, right? No, Unjo oh. is Banu. So they, they. So then they. <laughs> yes. So the Banu don't use gendered pronouns, so everything mm -hmm. is going to be they. And there's some tricky stuff about that when it happens in the plural in the language, but go read the document about that. We don't have time for that today. <laughs> um, when you say Unjo Sara, it just means unjo eat, basically. And then based on what's going on in the context, it's either past tense, it's ate or did eat. Mm -hmm. It's eats, as in as a general rule. Um, it's will eat. So they don't distinguish tense uh, the way we do. They can if they need to. There's a way to do it in the language, and that's all in the document, but they don't do it on a regular basis. Yeah, um, I didn't touch on this too much during the culture section, but they really don't care about what happened in the past. To them, it just doesn't matter. And so that's partially why they don't have a past tense. So they, don't, they don't really have much of a future tense either. What matters is now. Yeah. They'll talk about th that happened already or that's going to happen soon. Mm -hmm. But they don't really talk about the distant future mm -hmm. either. Yeah. So neither, they, yeah. neither are useful to them. So they, they just, just have their care. clocks. Yeah. No. If it's not on a, one of their clocks where it's going to happen at some point, mm -hmm. they just don't even think about it. Uh, the language has classification, which is... Um, basically assigning some kind of category to every noun in the language. So the Banu are very focused on value of things. Oh, oh my, yes. Yeah, so <laughs> zuo is something of valuable that's never been alive. Kto is something that is probably valuable in some way, but it was alive. So kto could be food, for example. That's a common slang word for talking about food. But kto could also be the classifier for a bowl made out of wood because the wood used to be a tree and the tree was alive. So they count things, the, the qualities of things, and how valuable they are very differently. Uh, so is something that's completely worthless, you know, probably not even recyclable. Um, go is just for average, everyday normal stuff that's just sitting around that you don't even think about very much. Af afa, though, is for very fancy stuff, like expensive things or somehow prestigious or desirable things or fancy people. <laughs> so if somebody is deserving of respect or you're trying to flatter them, for example, um, you might use afa to talk about them. Uh, isi is for places, utu is for people or animals, and this is like animals down to tiny little bugs and stuff. Once, delicious, you, get in, once you get into bacteria, they don't necessarily call that utu. Mm -hmm. But um, anything that like you could have some kind of relationship with, like mm -hmm. even have a bug on your finger, yeah. they think of that as it's being like, utu. Oh, Enge is for abstract things, like actions or concepts or ideas. And zo is for everything else. So anything that's particularly odd or strange would get categorized as nzo. Mm -hmm. So um, their classification is very important. And as an example, we talked about the word ipuma earlier, which means wing, like a wing on something. Uh, futugo ipuma would mean five wings, but on a vehicle. Specifically a vehicle. Yeah, so it's, a vehicle is a thing probably made out of metal, right? So it was, that's never been alive. But if you have an insect or an insect-like bug, and they have ipuma on them, that's going to be counted with kto. So selo kto ipuma two wings on some kind of insect or some kind of weird biomechanical thing that I've never seen before that um, is Maybe. alive. 
An arthropod. Yes, something. They do a lot of borrowing. We mentioned this. They borrow stuff, but they also borrow words. So they've borrowed the word tech, for example, the idea of just generic tech from, uh, from humans as techo. They loved the way it sounded. Yeah, and they put an extra K on the front because they could, and because the word for thousand in Banu is techo. So tech is techo, and techo means a thousand. Uh, with the word sano, it comes from shian, san. So mm -hmm. that means to, san is basically, you know, flight or travel. And they were really into the gravlev technology. Oh, yeah, yeah. The Xi'an were pioneer, are, are pioneers in gravlev technology. So Absolutely. when the Banu stole that or borrowed it, it's a more polite <laughs> word, um, yes. they, they borrowed the word for talking about it too. So sano means actually it's a verb that means to travel via gravlev technology. Um, and even mbaso for the verse got borrowed. But again, funneled into Banu phonology, the right. way they would tend to pronounce it. There's actually, without the M in front of it, there's no V in the language. There's an F, but there's no V. So um, to get a V sound, they had to stick an M on it. So that's what they did. And again, they're very casual about everything. As long as it's practical and it works, they love it. So let's give you an example. Would you, would what, you like to hear Banu? Would you like to hear what Banu sounds like? All right. OK. <laughs> Afatseri ubanu sainu ke ea sazo tai. Ee yu, a uto nja tseli tselai zokatafiki da. Ndi chingo. Yosho ingenge a salai ndi sato keke. Oh, ndai elana sato keke. Ifo kriso, inombe ocho a fiu fufu banu ke ea faina zotu tai. Mbesoma o cefaba so yela ektulo enga wakto fochoa ria so ganga finatai. Sao etombe ue fesisi faba tai so tai and due gongo to tai. And and due gongo to tai and due gongo. And due gongo to tai. Ganga kida, maybe too long. Okay. Nza ya zai zonzofo new to fumbaso. Yon dain dai. So there you go. There's your example of what Banu sounds like. <laughs> and next, we're going to talk about the tremendous technical undertaking mm -hmm. that it took for all of us to be able to just type A, B, C, D, E, F, G, or M, V, or K, yeah, T, or as it may right. be, uh, on our keyboards beautiful. and get ah. the result that you've been seeing on the screen. So with great deference and gratitude, I pass the clicker to Chris. Mm -hmm. Okay, the first step um, in the creation of the font is um, that Britain uh, sends me his document where he already he designed all the, the forms of, of, the, of, the, length, of the, the writing and uh, everything. And <coughs> basically in Banu, you have, um, it's like a matrix. You have um, at, the, at the left in the, in the blue in this example, it's not everything, it's just, just an excerpt. Um, in blue are the, the uh, consonants, the pure consonant form, but normally this, this form is not, it's not directly written. It's all, it's every, um, all, all that's, that's written is with the diacritics that, form the, that add the, the vowels. But um, these, these forms can be typed or can be used to, for teaching, for example. So you, you can show this is the, the, the essence of the, the of the consonant. And then um, you have on, on the, the right or the, the six um, vowels um, for, the, for the I, for the, for the A, and the other to the O. And it's, it's just like a matrix um, in, in, a, in a table. So on the, on the, on the bottom right, you, you have Zwo, for example. And you, you can see um, there, are, there are elements that, that define these diacritics and elements that define the the, um, consonant, the pure consonant form. And um, my next step was to import the, this um, from, from the PDF I got, to import this, this raw um, forms and find um, fin a finite set of elements that I was talking about um, earlier in, in Banu, where, um, where you define the, uh, um, a set of elements so, so that you don't have to, to do everything manually, but you, um, you um, <coughs> uh, 
can combine them like 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 a, like a Lego set. You can combine them to 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 build um, all the the characters in the in the alphabet from these components. Mm -hmm. Kind of yeah. similar to cursive, right? Yes. Well, yes. it's it's like I mean, he had to do a complex visual analysis, like ignore all the the mm -hmm. mechanics of it and and visually analyze what were the, all the core element components and how he could break them out and make the smallest set possible yeah. to, to have all the parts that he needed to combine them. Yeah. So um, when I identified the, this, this set of, of components, then I um, uh, Im imported all the elements into my uh, font design application. And then uh, the next task was to, to redo all the, the vector data. You see on the, on the left with, with, a, with a blue um, uh, anchor points, and in the, the little magnification area, you see, you see this was the, the raw source data. There you have many, many uh, anchor points in the vector data, and um, if you want, if you would use this uh, directly as a, as a font, you would, uh, because in the, in the text you can have hundreds and thousands of characters. Yeah, this would be overkill and would would be uh, make the fonts unnecessarily big and, and slow. So the, uh, you have to, to redo all on the right side and with the, with the green anchor points. You see um, the, the redone um, a cleaned up version and where all the, the roundings are in. You, you see even in the, um, in the left side where, where the red dot is in the, in the, in the sharp corner, they have added a little, a little very small rounded corner. So if, even if you have uh, characters that got blown, over, blown uh, for big um, signage or something, you ha don't have uh, sharp corners, you have everything rounded and organic. Oh yeah, that smooth look, yeah. love it. So basically he had to do a bunch of cleanup because I wasn't careful about it. But you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's normal, <laughs> no problem. And then after, after um, creating, uh, recreating the vector data for all the, these, um, these uh, components, I um, started to import all the, the glyphs. Look at all those glyphs. All the raw data glyphs into, into the uh, font application. And then I um, just re rebuilt them um, out of these, this component set. And you, you see in the, in the next image, um, you see um, these are the, um, uh, the components assembled to, to one of the characters we saw earlier. And um, in the, the highlight areas are the, the areas where the components they, they just overlap. They don't are uh, not, not corrected, uh, connected, but, but the uh, the overlap is is, um, is made so it's made perfect that there are no uh, uh, no seams and no edges uh, uh, mm -hmm. visible. Yeah, it's really a be yeah. he did a beautiful job. And That's when you get to play with it, you're going to be I mean, you just like sit there and you're like, what if I type this? Now you have to be typing Banu words. You can't you can't type a word that has a th in it, for example, because they don't even have an h in Banu. Yeah. But as long as you're typing Banu words, mm -hmm. they're going to appear like magic before your eyes in the word process. Yeah, and, and um, the magic is, is uh, it's, uh, because af after this stage, when I, I, I've created all the, all, uh, assembled all the, um, the letters uh, in, the, in the alphabet from, from the components, um, the next step is to add the functionality in the open type. So um, this is a little excerpt of, of the open type feature code. For example, this, um, uh, you see lookup ligatures. This is the start where um, the ligatures uh, lookup is defined. Basically, it, uh, it goes over, the, over all the letters. And if and in, the sec in the line 126, for example, there's, there's substitute NDZA. So when you type NDZA, this rule set um, fits and it re replaces the, all four letters by the NDZA ligature. So you get the, the nza letter when you type it. Yeah, the syllable. I, I call or, it a syllable. Or syllable, yeah. Yeah, in yeah. Obano, in, in, it's, yeah, it's, it's a, a syllable, <laughs> syllable, yeah. In yeah. Banu, they're called ochoa. Ochoa means a, a letter or a specific glyph or a syllable of writing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, and there is, there's some uh, sp special cases where, where you, uh, I created additional, additional um, glyphs in, in, the, in the font, and this is um, for example, this um, you, you have two syllables, and on the on the left side you see in, in red there's the, the vertical element. It it connects to, to the to the di, to the diacritics. The, it's an e di diacritic mm -hmm. on this letter, and um, it's get, uh, it's a, a round shape without any any edges. But then when you uh, type further, 
you see that the, the next E diacritic uh, comes very near to, to the, the lower end of the vertical, um, of the, of the it's called irregular stress mark. And um, when this is the case, there's a, in, in, the, in the open type feature code, there's a special uh, rule set and special glyph that can, it will be used that um, automatically connects these uh, diacritics with the, with the uh, regular stress mark to, uh, to form a connection between them. And this is um, for, I think it's about nine uh, different cases where this can happen with all the different forms of diacritics that, and all combinations that are possible. So he, he made, he went to a lot of work. He did. So that it would look really pretty effortlessly for everybody out there and for us. Oh, for we, us, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We've had a lot of typing to do recently. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and with all the, the special, special uh, glyphs I had to create to, to be able to combine these together, um, the, the Barnaf font has, has around uh, nine, a little bit over 900 um, glyphs in, in the font. It's not as hard as it sounds, though. <laughs> it really is. Yeah, I've, I've invested a lot of effort to make it easy to write. Yeah. And um, after, after this, this step, when you have the, the completed feature code with all special ex exceptions, and there are some, some things that um, uh, Britton and me uh, uh, talked about and, mm -hmm. and f found out about, uh, by working with the language. And uh, for example, um, one, one day I, uh, Britton uh, uh, sent me an email that Oh, we need a complete new new uh, consonant. Is this possible? That okay? <laughs> yes, it's possible. And uh, I think two hours later, I, I sent him the, the new the new set with all new um, consonants and vowel combinations mm -hmm. because I had the the, the um, completed components. It was, was just assembling them and form new new um, uh, syllables. I think it was more like 20 minutes instead of two hours. Okay. He's very, good. <laughs> he's very, very good with fonts. <laughs> <Thanks. laughs> That's right. Didn't you? Um, when did you guys introduce the currency symbols? Uh, kind of late yeah. on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Really. We added them uh, later in the. Yeah, but that like I sent it to you, and uh, I mean, an hour later, or maybe it was the next morning. But it's That's really he's fast, really fast. Yeah. He's really good. Mm -hmm. And by doing this, we re I realized that um, all this, cu this currency and number uh, situation has had it to be added to the Xi'an font too. So we we directly add, um, expanded the Xi'an uh, font with this fi functionality too. Oh yeah, that's right. The uh, the creation of the Banu font helped us identify areas that the, we needed to patch in the Xi'an font. Mm -hmm. It takes a village. Yeah, it does. Yeah. It does. It takes a village. It takes a lot of um, real case, real use cases. Yeah. 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 And it, it helps. Like it, it, as always, it's just like a real language. It keeps developing. And it mm -hmm. keeps changing. It keeps adapting to new situations as they arise. Just like the Banu. Yeah. Just like the Banu. <laughs> shall we move? Shall we move on and take some questions? Oh, yeah. Um, how much time do we have left? We we'll probably have some time. We probably have a little bit of time. I, I think they'll come, they'll come warn us if we don't have time. Yeah. But, <laughs> um, but um, we'd be happy to take any questions that someone has. Skip to the next slide. Yeah. What do you have? Which human languages I'm going to repeat the question for the sake of the rest of the audience. Which human languages were helpful in inspiring the sounds of the Banu language? So um, no one or two languages specifically, but um, I would say the vowels are, are uh, just kind of pan-European. You know, <laughs> I, like the, I like the Italian word die, so the I sound and the kind of, you know, that came from that. But the, the initial nasals, like the M and the N coming before um, the consonants, those are common in African languages. Uh, the sonority hierarchy, I think, might be, like, just alien. Is that, is that pure Britain? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I would love, if somebody knows a human language that has a vowel son sonority hierarchy rule like that, I really want to talk to you, because I couldn't find one. Mm -hmm. So that might be the only thing that's uniquely alien about the mm -hmm. way the language works. Um, but... Uh, yeah, they came from kind of all over the place. I mean, the vowels are pretty generic. Um, because we, we don't have consonants at the end, we, I thought we needed at least six vowels, but I also didn't want to make it complicated and put vowels in there that aren't 
broadly, easily pronounceable by by lots of different lots of different cultures, human cultures. Right. Yeah. So, one one of the challenges of making a truly alien language is that you do have to consider human limitations in speaking it because we want human actors to be able to say it, for example, not only the fans, but you know, like we, have, we do have to use our mouth parts to make the language happen. Yeah, I mean, when I <laughs> fantasize about other languages in the verse, oh, yes. um, I think about some really kind of exotic stuff, but you know, this, mm -hmm. this needs to be very approachable. And mm -hmm. it also works with the Banu culture because they, they just adapt to everything. So it makes you think that it, it could very easily happen that anything that's not convenient for them as rampant traders, you know, having to interact with other people, it would just drop off. And their lifespan is very short compared to ours. So right. a generation is very short, so the language can change very rapidly, actually. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Yes, over here. <laughs> Ooh, helpful microphone, friend. Thank you. Um, yeah, I've got two. Uh, one of them's about culture and the other one's about the written language. All right. Uh, in regards to the culture, I noticed you have three words for value. Uh, one which is uh, inanimate, one that was organic, and that one that is uh, extreme value. So is it in Banu culture that there is a separation between non-organic and organic, but when it gets to a certain level, they just become um, like really valuable, and so there's no deferation. Uh, and in regards to uh, the um, written language, uh, to write it out, like in Chinese, how you have to go from top and left to write oh. out the s symbols. Is there a similar thing in the Banu language? Right. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. The Afa thing is correct. That's a good observation. Yeah, once, once anything gets to this level of, of just being especially important, again, it could be for value, but it could also be for mm -hmm. a role in society or something like that. Actually, when I... When I addressed Sherry in the dialogue, I called her Afatseri, and that means that I'm being respectful to her mm -hmm. because we, I mean, because I do respect her. <laughs> but also, it's it's a it's just a nice way to show that you're you're showing normal respect to somebody. All right, and um, like. If a Banu is trying to sell you something, they might call everything that they have Afa in a way to like subtly imply. Yeah, that they it's might super call great. their own stuff Afa too yeah. to try to trick you into haggling less, maybe. Yeah. I mean, that, so there, that that's a that can change. In the same example with wing Ipuma being either this kind of wing or that kind of wing, uh, things can shift too, mm -hmm. and they can they can to be really disrespectful, they wouldn't do it to your face, I wouldn't think, but behind no. somebody's back, they might, they might call something so, which means, oh, that worthless piece of blank, um, <laughs> talking about a thing that normally doesn't have so on it. Mm -hmm. So that, that can happen too, again, in playing with the language. Mm -hmm. And about the written language, um, it's written left to right, uh, and a kind of normal, as we would think about it in English or European language order, but it's always centered. Mm -hmm. And the punctuation is a little bit different and funky. They have... Oh, right. You can see an example of the punctuation here in this slide. It's punctuated at the, both the beginning and the end. Yeah. So that circle, that, the half circle and the circle says we're starting a sentence here. And then the one at the end is that we're ending it here. And you'll get unusual things like what we would think of as an entire question in English, for example, um, will be a statement with a little tiny part in it that's a question. So they put the question marks just around the little tiny part that's a question. Right. So you'll find um, you do have to learn some, you know, not typical Englishy, Europeany, Asiany kinds of things to to get the punctuation right mm -hmm. in, in typing Banu. Right. Um, was that a challenge to code the uh, punctuation at the beginning and end? Yes, um, uh, partly um, because we use um, the uh, like in like in Spanish we use at the, at the beginning for the excla exclamation mark the the upside down exc exclamation yeah. mark and at the end the normal exc exclamation mark and the same for the question mark. But um, I think the, the biggest challenge was to, um, to have uh, the, this, the, the dot at the, at the beginning and the dot at the end, because it's the, sa the same, um, the same uh, character you, you typed. It just cannot differentiate directly, but I had to do, to do this um, by a rule set. 
So there are special cases when you have a start one sentence and um, a stop it and start a new sentence so that all, everything gets um, formatted right there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then the decimal point is different again. Yeah, the decimal right. point is not the same as these periods for sentences. Yeah. And the number, the numerals for numbers are very fun for people who like yeah. math. <laughs> um, do we have uh, any other questions? Hi. Um, yeah, I was just wondering if the Banu language has any contractions or <laughs> slang. Oh, recently. so many. <laughs> so oh. it's almost it's, nothing yeah. but contractions. It, yeah, it's yeah. almost all contractions. And it's, it's, um, there are two different ways to speak Banu. There's um, Zopamba, which is like really carefully enunciating everything and saying every word separately. And then there's uh, Zoyilo. And Zoyilo means just contracted, like everything runs together. So mm -hmm. earlier, we were speaking primarily uh, zoyilo, meaning just the way Banu would to each other. So that was all contractions. Yeah, it's not really an idea of formality. The question was, is it a difference between being formal and informal? Oh, it's, no. it's not really that. Um, it's just that. Um, a contract, for example, yeah, would probably be written uh, Zopamba, but that's because they're just thinking about it very, very carefully, and and it it will, would get more attention. But they don't really have a concept of formality around language the way the way we do. I mean, there's some they would use different words, like they would use afa, and there's ceremonial things that they do that are about you know propriety and being you know being careful but yeah the like their they their default speech is all zoyilo which means just run everything together and um you have to ask them to speak zopamba if you need need them to oh yeah and they'd be happy to do so and if, they can yeah. because they they all the words are individual words but those o's and those e's drop out all the time and that's when something like foeto which means it's mine or it belongs to me just becomes feto <laughs> so the O just goes away, and you have to learn that that F at the beginning is really a different word that got glued onto mm -hmm. ilo, so, so ilo, into the, into the eto. Right. right. Um, I think there were some questions on the side of the room. Yes, in the white shirt and cap. Mm -hmm. Can you uh, speak? Yeah, le I can't, I'm sorry, I can't hear. Sorry. Um, we saw uh, six ways of writing the same glyph uh, yeah. earlier. Oh, all the different yeah. fonts. Uh, the blue one was uh, the formal one, right? Or does that mean this is the pure essence of the typo, and then it is, uh, it is written a different way by, uh, I, I don't know, users of the language mm -hmm. uh, that are maybe different in the way they are writing? So. Um, does that mean this is the same glyph written in different type typos? Yes, it's just a stylistic. It's not a question of formal or informal way no, of, type no. of writing it. No, it's their idea of of changing a style on something is just to to attract attention okay. to it. So they would um, for documents that need a, like a long, complicated contract they would tend to write that in a very simple, plain kind of font. But if they are trying to sell uh, a, a new invention that they have borrowed from the Xi'an or something like that, they might put a really yeah. fancy font on it just so you would pay attention to their advertising. Yeah, or, or one they made themselves, just, you know, hey, yeah. look at this, this but is great. The, the font that Chris has built, the, the original easy to read, uh, the, the one that I designed that's going to be released, uh, today, right? Yes. Is um, well, um, the font itself will be up soon, soon. in the fan Sorry. kit, no, but the uh, Rust Society document is up right yeah, now. Yeah, so you can go learn how to read it today. But that font is designed to be legible, even at small type sizes. Some of these things that I showed you earlier, where it looks like horns sticking out and all that other stuff, that that would be more for like big advertising on yeah. a poster. Or something Absolutely. Like that. And let's uh, let's get your question right there. Yeah, I saw you. We, we don't have much time. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Hello. Uh, Chris, Hi. Can you help me? My English is not so good. I ask it in uh, German, okay? Okay. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, hab, haben Sie die uh, körperlichen Gegebenheiten der Aliens mit berücksichtigt, als Sie die entwickelt haben, die Sprachen? Okay. Um, did you think of, of the um, um, physiology of the, of the Bahnhof by um, 
uh, developing the, lang the language. So is there any uh, specialties? Oh, yes. Yes. Very not, much. not in the sounds of the language, but in the, in the vocabulary. And, uh, and a, a lot of the, the cultural, the, the phrases, the common phrases. So one of the common phrases is um, when a human is talking to Banu, is can you speak more quietly? Because their hearing is very bad, so they yell all the time. So we are more likely to ask them to whisper to what is a whisper to them, yeah. because it's too loud for us. Well, from a, from a Banu perspective, our ears are overly sensitive. Yeah. So <laughs> they don't think of themselves as hard of hearing. They just think of us as really like, OK, I guess, I guess I'll whisper for you. If, I'll help your delicate ears. It's just, it's all a matter of perspective. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, do we have any more questions before? Oh, so many. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, you talked about how Banu uh, lend or borrow the, the languages or the words from other languages that they have contact with. Uh, how do, would, would they revert to someone who's well known, for instance, a well known trader of the Terrans or of the, of the, of the UEE? So the na how do, would they convert a name that they would not pronounce in their proper language with the syllables and so on? Oh, I see. They'll, they'll get as close as they can with yeah. what they are. They have the ability to pronounce. They might, um, they might drop a syllable here or there. Just, they, wouldn't, it wouldn't, they were not necessarily dropping a syllable. They're just kind of what compressing a syllable. Like, um, what's your name? What's yeah. your name? Uh, sorry, I could. Um, Andrew. Andrew. So, um, uh, Andrew would be um, Ando with an O that you would try not to say. There's a mark actually in the language that you can put on an O sound that says to the Banu, try not to pronounce this. So they could probably manage um, Andrew pretty well. Yeah, they yeah. could say that. Now, most names in Banu um, start, in fact, all native names in Banu start with a consonant. So a name starting with a vowel is kind of unusual to them because all the nouns in the language start with vowels. So there's an explanation in the document about what happens when you have a name like uh, Henry, which they would call Enri or Yenri. You know, they, they, they do make some changes, but there's some hints in the document about what you would do to make your name work in Banu, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Good question. Hi there. Uh, you mentioned how you came up with the concept of a language to be pronounceable by people for the purposes of acting. Right. But is there an appetite to make a language that could not be spoken by people and perhaps had to be synthesized to be used in the game? Um, I can't say either way that we have anything like that planned. It sounds like it would be, to me, that would be a really fun avenue to explore. Um, there are some ideas that we've passed around in, um, among the narrative team that again, I cannot get into, but oh man. I mean, as an idea, <laughs> I have an appetite for it. But yeah, definitely we'll, have we'll an appetite see, for we'll it. We'll see how that plays out in yeah. the future. And then the other question I had was, uh, the glyphs are quite complex. Is there a sort of shorthand, uh, handwritten version of the language that the there, can oh, write yes. more, more quickly? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there, nothing is published yet, and I wouldn't say that it's absolutely completely fleshed out yet, but in the early stages of prototyping what Banu might be as a written language, um, I did come up with a, a shorthand, but it is considerably harder to read <laughs> than what you see up there yeah, because, of, because of what they do to get a cursive simplified writing yeah, out, of, so. out of that. So for the time being, mm -hmm. um, the closest thing to, to writing will be, you saw it in some of the, the font looking things up there where it's just, mm -hmm. um, the strokes are not so straight and formal, but there, there is a way to have pretty handwriting in Banu al already in a couple of the examples yeah. in the document. Yeah. And just to emphasize, Banu as a language is very forgiving. As long as you get an approximation of the shapes that are in it, it doesn't have to be that perfect curve. It doesn't have to be that perfect balance. This is very much the Times New Roman to any English handwriting. Yeah. This is, yeah, you don't, you don't need to worry about getting this precisely right. Yeah, the writing is based on these rules about the, the capsule. And as long as you have something that is a standard capsule-ish shape and the openings are where they need to be mm -hmm. and 
the curves in them, I mean, if the curve is bumpy at the left and smooth at the right, then as long as it's always bumpy at the left and smooth at the right, it doesn't really matter how, how bumpy it is at the left. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. There, there's a lot of tolerance, I think, for, for variation. Mm -hmm. right. Are we still good on time? Uh, we were told we had five minutes a little while oh, ago. Oh, okay. So maybe one more question, if anybody else has another Yeah, does anybody have? Yeah. Okay, right in the middle. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can yeah, if you could just speak louder. If no, you don't someone. Have a mic. I can speak louder. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Colorful, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, they like they like colorful, they like shiny things, but that doesn't mean necessarily mean everything is going to be like that. It's like um, like human culture is very many and varied. Uh, we tend to like fashionable things. We tend to like nice things, but not all of us do, basically. Yeah, and they they, I mean, again, this is my assumption, so I invite you, Afas <laughs> Zeri, to correct me if I'm wrong, but. Um, they they want their customer to be happy too right? they do yes so they they would it would not be unusual for them to adapt something not necessarily to their own personal cultural taste in the hopes that it would make you know non-banu happy about something right all right okay. so um thank you so much for all the uh time that you took today to attend our panel we loved your questions uh we love being able to tell you about the banu language that we worked so hard on for the past year um and we're looking forward to seeing what you do with it now that it's out in the world sorry and one thing i wanted to add um in uh, Currently in the in Spectrum, we have a, 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 the wash on the Xi'an chat room. Uh -huh. Yeah, we do. I, I, I hope that, I, th I think there will, will be added a That's Banu right. chat we, room. That's right, we did add it, we added a Banu chat room today, this morning. So you, if you want to go talk in Banu, you can do it right now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. you.